Okay, so welcome to the third and last day of this, of this event. And uh, we're extremely happy to uh, have with us again Olivia Mathieu, who is going to deliver the second uh, Jose Adam uh, memorial lecture. And, well, I don't think I have to I have to say more words about Jose Adam or about Olivia since we've already heard that on, uh, well, some of us have heard this, this on Tuesday and uh, on Wednesday. And he will speak on three Jordan algebras. And this is, this is a joint work with Irina Kashuba. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a big honor to be here, maybe a little bit too big, and that's why, uh, that's why the virus came. So let's start with the problem. I'm working over a field of characteristic zero, C, so the theory is in characteristic zero, and I'm looking at three Jordan algebras. So what a Jordan algebra is, I will give a bad definition first, and then there will be a better definition later on. The starting definition is a, is a commutative algebra, but not associative. which satisfies the following property, x, y, x square equal x, y, x square. Of course, if you write it like this, it looks ridiculous, but it is a non-associative algebra, so when you make parentheses, this becomes a real identity. And uh, it's clear that there are three Jordan algebras. This is a generic statement. And so let's, for a given integer d, let g of d be the free Jordan algebra with generators with D generators X1 XD so it takes a free Jordan algebra with D generators and then of course G equal G of D as a decomposition as a diaxon of G n of D where G n of D are simply all elements, all products of exactly D generators. Depending on your taste, you can assume that the Jordan algebra is with a unit or not. Uh, here, to simplify, I will use a non unital Jordan algebra, but it's not a big deal. You mean N generators? D generators. It's the product of X. Oh, sorry. N generators, sorry. Yeah, you are right. And so you have G of D which starts with G1 of D plus G2 of D and so on. And what I would like to explain now is a conjecture about G 
Gn of d. What is Gn of d? So Gn of d, this is a Gl of d module, of course, and the conjecture that I will not state is that the character of Gn of d is given by some combinatorics. But to simplify in my talk, I will not speak about Gn of d as Gl n of the as GL of the module, I will just speak about the dimension. And then I will give a precise statement about the dimension. Simply, you know, on the blackboard it would be very painful to write a conjecture for the character, but the spirit is exactly the same. So, let's introduce So now to give a conjecture for the dimension, I need to introduce a certain function psi that I could not remember. It is d z t minus one plus one minus d z minus t. Because this is a polynomial in two, two variables. And, uh, and I say that uh, the conjecture is that uh, dimension of Gn of Z equal a n, where a n is uniquely defined by the following equation. The residue at t equals zero of the product from one minus ZNT, one minus, sorry, one minus ZNT plus T minus one plus Z2N to the AN Psi DT. This uh, should be equal to zero. Maybe I should put it. So, the, so, so the residue means when you write this expression, you get formal series in t and t minus one and z, and the residue when you take residue of t means you take the t minus one part. So a priori, the residue will be a function, formal function in Z. Okay. And now when you want, when you look at this equation, you see easily, it's easy to show that it defines the AN inductively. And it's very easy because, okay, that's, when you know the first AN, you gave a, it provides you a formula for the next one. But this induction formula is not easy to handle. It's easy to prove unicity, but it's difficult to handle. And at that time, at that time, we don't have a closed formula. for the AN. The only thing we have is a combinatorics for that. Okay. So 
So this is the conjecture, the main conjecture. And <clears throat> and when you state a conjecture like this, uh, it seems normally it does. It seems a bit strange. Means you don't see where it came from, but at least. What I like in this conjecture is that the, the only thing I introduce uh, really is a psi, and the psi is reasonably easy. Means, for example, I could have tried to, uh, for example, for, for some value, the dimension of gn of d is known, so I can have tabulate that and try to find the ideal psi for that and find an extremely complicated formula such a case it will be not so interesting. But here the size is reasonably small. And first of all, I would like to explain, so, now the talk will be like this. First I will explain some evidence supporting the conjecture. Then, I will explain conjecture two, which is much more natural, in my view, but less elementary. This is a purely combinatorics conjecture. More natural, but less elementary. And I will see also some uh, evidence for this conjecture, and I will explain why conjecture 2 implies conjecture 1. And I first was almost sure that conjecture 2 should be very easy. And then I gave some talks with even some uh, people in the audience room who are thinking they can prove it. But indeed, conjecture 2 is not, uh, now, does not seem so easy. I will explain what the natural idea to prove it and why it does not work. And then it turns out that conjecture 2 is made of two, pa two pieces, and one of the piece, uh, on, on one, one half of the conjecture is, uh, say, tractable in some sense, means you, there is some structure with this, and the second part is really much more mysterious. And so, then I will say it's conjecture 3, which is a tractable part of conjecture 2. And I will explain that conjecture 3, indeed, is enough to prove conjecture 1. And by doing this proof, we'll see also some new phenomena uh, concerning uh, Jordan algebras, which are very so, so the evidence for the conjecture is very simple. Uh, Gn of d, the dimension of Gn of d, is known for some cases. And and so I can check that in these cases, it corresponds to the conjecture. So the first case is for d equal 1. Then it is well known that the dimension of g n of d is 1. This is extremely elementary to show that the free Jordan algebra is essentially the polynomial algebra. 
And now when you look at this... Uh, Sorry, but I can see that for unital Jordan algebras, that would be true, but for the non-unital ones, oh. the degree three parts, how do you know that there's no. not two different X cubes? The, no, there is no... Has four, uh, the, the relation to finding Jordan algebras has X, Y, and X squared. So that's yeah, yes, but, yeah, but X, X, yes, but... No, no, even, even without this, x, x squared is certainly the same as x squared x. So in degree 3, there is no. No, no. I don't see why that. Because it's commutative. Oh, it's commutative, right? Yeah. No, well, the, it there is no, in characteristics, okay, I don't, I don't know well the theory in characteristic p. Yeah. But in characteristic 0, there is no difference uh -huh. between. Uh, uh, unitary and non-unitary free Jordan algebra. means uh -huh. you get the free Jordan algebra, unitary algebra, by adding a unit. Yeah, I had just forgotten it was a unit. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's very, there is no, no difference. Maybe in, character, in small characteristics, maybe there is a trouble, but I don't know. It's not. And, and then you can, you can see that uh, the con that um, this is okay, and to prove it, and this follows easily from uh, the following identity that the product of 1 minus ZNT, 1 minus ZNT minus 1, 1 minus ZN equals the sum of minus to the n, what it is? Uh, uh, z, oops, at the room, uh, probably it's z n, oops, sorry, Jacobi identity. So, I'm sorry, I'm a bit tired and I could not remember could not write again the Jacobi identity, but there is a classical Jacobi identity from which you deduce that this is compatible with the, the that the, the an should be one in that case. In the case d equal two, we, do, we use a computer. Okay, first there is a Shirchhoff theorem. which says that g of 2 is simply this, the symmetric part of the tensor algebra. This is a free associative algebra with two generators. And sigma is the involution which send each generator to itself. So it means, yeah, so, and, and, uh, <coughs> and this is stable by uh, Jordan product, and Shirchhoff theorem tells you that this is like this, and therefore the dimension of Gn of 2 is equal to let me check it again. Uh, it should be equal to 2, 1 half of 2 to the n plus 2 to the n divided by 2 if n even or uh, twice dimension of g n minus 1 of 2 if n is odd. So it means that in uh, with two generators there is an explicit formula for the dimension and the dimension is essentially this except that when n is odd there is a small difference. Okay? And then we have been able to prove And so the computer show 
that the conjecture is OK for n less or equal than 15. We stop, we stop at some point, the computation. But. but the more interesting case is a case d equal 3. This is a much more interesting case. So, in that case, there is a theorem of Glenys proves that uh, Gn of 3 is isomorphic to the symmetric part of the tensor algebra. for n less or equal than 7. And now, you have also a map. When you take the degree 8 part of the Jordan algebra, it is going to T8, 3 sigma. This is on 2. And here, you have a kernel which is given by Glenny identities. Okay, it means that when d equals 3, the Jordan algebra is known up to degree 8. And in degree 8, there is something special, is that here you have a three-dimensional vector space. which are special identities. It means they are identities which are not satisfied, which are uh, satisfied in associative algebras. In as any associative algebra, this will be there. And with a computer, shows that a n equal dimension of Gn of D for n less or equal than 8. And this is nice because when you take the dimension of this, it is given by a very smooth formula, a little bit like the one I wrote over there. But here you see suddenly there is a three-dimensional vector space which blows up. And still, our, uh, the, our combinatorics uh, provide this information. So in some sense, the identity, of the, the conjecture I wrote at the beginning contains, in some sense, Glenny identities. Which and next case, which is also quite interesting, is the case D equal 4. And in the case d equals 4, you have a map, always a map from gn of d to tn. Sorry. As usual, you have a map from gn of d to tn. tn of 4 invariant by, by sigma, and you have some kernel. But this map here, is not always surjective. And as it has been shown by Kohn, uh, Gn of 4, OK, it's, it's known that it's embed into Tn of 4, sigma. But there is a missing part, which is the tetrad. Tetrad is also the, uh, is, is known as the levitsky amisur identity, which is not part of that. And so, but uh, Gn, sorry, G, 
G4, sorry, degree 4. Degree four. And Gn of 4 equal Tn for sigma for n less or equal than 3. And it, it's also relatively easy to compute the, the free Jordan algebra up to degree uh, 7, I think. Yes. And so we have been able to check that the conjecture is OK up to n equals 7. And it means that the conjecture understood the fact that in the free Jordan algebra, the tetrad are missing. So there is two special phenomena in, uh, in uh, Jordan algebra, the fact that these special identities and the missing tetrads. And this is contained in the identity. Of course, it is known that there is much more special phenomena of Jordan algebra in very, very high degree. Uh, I think Medvedev and Zelmanov found uh, incredible polynomial in degree 30 something and but we, we cannot uh, since we cannot compute the free journal algebra at this at this level uh, we cannot check if if uh, the conjecture predict or say anything about that in some sense so this is kind of evidence uh, supporting the conjecture and now I would like to explain conjecture two. So, of course, I stated this conjecture, and but I don't believe it's possible to prove it like this. Means. I'm very skeptical that it would be possible to find an explicit basis of free Jordan algebras. And especially the com combinatorics does not give a close formula, so I'm a bit uh, worried about uh, the fact that it's possible to prove it in a combinatorial way. So the conjecture two is a way to try to prove the conjecture by using more mathematics tools than simple combinatorics. So now we, and then I will explain why conjecture two implies conjecture one. So for the conjecture two, I need to recall that given a Jean algebra any Jordan algebra, J, uh, we can associate a kind of Lie algebra, SL2 of J. This Lie algebra occurs first in, uh, it's occurs, it has been uh, shown by Tits, a beginning of of 60s, and then this construction has been generalized to more uh, to Jordan pairs and related structures by Kusher and Cantor, and so this is why this is this is known as the TKK construction. One K refer to Kusher and one to Cantor, and probably the expert knows which one is which one is Cantor and which one is Kusher. But and I would but I will not explain this construction because this construction has been uh, refined now the re refinement. 
only in the original TITS construction, means only for journal algebra, it has been refined, refined by Allison and Gao. And I will explain now the Allison and Gao refinement. So Alison and Gao introduced some B of G, the kind of gadget, which is defined as follows. You take wedge 2 of J modulo edge wedge A square. Well, the, the span of all elements of type A wedge A square. Of course, this remembers us the cyclic cohomology construction. And the SL2 of J, as defined by Allison and Gao, by definition is J tensor SL2 plus B of J. And it turns out that this is it is a Lie algebra and maybe I need to explain how to make the bracket of elements. So if I define x of a to be x tensor a, then x a y b bracket of x a by y b is given by bracket of x by y a b plus uh, killing of x y tensor with times uh, a wedge b. Okay, and so this explains the bracket between two elements here. It remains to explain the bracket between element here and there, and between two elements there. But basically, if you take A, edge, way B, you define D of A, wedge B, of C, so define this as A, C, B, minus A, C, B. So what means D of A wedge B applying to C, where there, is three, there are elements in the journal algebra, it is the associator. And as before, you should remember that this is non-associative, so I should put parentheses. Yeah, so this is... Uh, and basically, the... And basically, the, the product of wedge way B, product with X C, by definition, this is X of D A B of C, and A wedge B bracket with C wedge D, this is given by D A B of C wedge D plus C wedge D A B of D. So it's given by a certain formula. Okay, there is something which is obvious here is that you have noticed that A wedge B is defined is an element modulo this relation, A wedge A square. But you see immediately that D of A wedge A square is indeed equal to zero, because this is exactly the same as Jordan identity. It is the same as A 
B A square equal uh, A B A square. So, and so it's basically easy to prove that this is a Lie algebra. First of all, it has been proved by Allison and Gao, so I don't have to care so much. But there is the only uh, point which is not totally obvious is that the fact that the product, that this product is Q-symmetric. This is not really not obvious. Jacob will easily recognize that this is a Lode algebra. That's it, easy to prove that it is Lode algebra, but then to prove that it's a Lie algebra is a little bit more subtle. And, uh, but Alison Gao proved it, so. And now I, introdu I introduce the following category. I forgot, when, when do, 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 did I start? You started at 9.35. Ah, 9.35, okay. And now let's introduce the following category T. is a category of SL2 modules. Uh, which M, which are of the type M equal a adjoint component plus a trivial component. So we take all SL2 modules of any possible dimension so that it contains only two isotypical components. And you see easily that SL2 of J, of course, is a SL2 module, lives in category T. Because SL2 of J is J tensor SL2, which is adjoint representation, and B of J commutes with SL2. And now there is a simple statement uh, yeah, I will state it as a lemma. But indeed, it's an abstract lemma, means it's a nonsense lemma. Is that SL2J is a free Lie algebra in category T. Of course, what, what do I mean by a Lie algebra in category T? I mean a Lie algebra on which SL2 acts by derivation in a such way that it decomposes as adjoint representation plus trivial representation. So that's really a kind of obvious statement. And now you know that free algebras have very nice properties. Uh, their property is that their cohomology is trivial, except in degree 0 and 1. So here we have a freely algebra, but it's freely algebra in a certain category. And so it's relatively natural to to say that conjecture 2 is that the cohomology uh, of SL2J, when you take <coughs> the ordinary Lie algebra cohomology, this is the SL2 module, has no adjoint or trivial component for k greater or equal than 2. Okay. This is the conjecture. 
And take the common, the, okay, here I state it in terms of homology, but I say that essentially the homology is trivial for k equal, bigger than or equal than 2, at least if you look only the adjoint and trivial component. Because you see, the category T cares only about the trivial and the adjoint component. So you expect that, it, that the freeness will only inform you about the trivial and the adjoint component of the homology. And now, I will explain why conjecture 2 implies conjecture 1. Indeed, it's uh, what it implies is a little bit better. It implies the following. You denote by an equals the dimension of gn d and let denote by bn the dimension of bn d. Because b also has a grading. And now the conjecture 2 implies the following. When you take the residue Uh, of uh, phi uh, t minus 1 minus 1 dt this is equal to 1 and the residue at t equals 0 of phi times, maybe I should put t minus 1 in front, and the residue of 1 minus t phi dt should be equal to dz, where phi is given by the product for n equal 1 to infinity of 1 minus z n t to the a n 1 minus z n t minus 1 to the a n 1 minus z n uh, to the a n plus b n. So exactly, conjecture 2 implies these two equations, and these two equations determine uniquely the an and the bn. And why conjecture? So conjecture 2 provides you not only a formula for the dimension, combinatorics for the dimension of this, but also for that. And why? why we can deduce from conjecture 2, conjecture 1, uh, simply because if I add the two identities, so I will get the residue at t equals 0, so I will, I will add, sorry, what I say is wrong, here there is a minus, minus sign. So let's add dz times the first identity plus the second identity, so I will get zero. So, but the residue is linear to z. So I will get that the residue of t minus one minus 1 times dz plus uh, 
1 minus t phi enfin, dt z should be equal to 0. OK? Uh, if I'm correct, this should be exactly my psi from the beginning. And so I get that the residue at t equals 0 of psi times phi dt equals 0. But in this identity, you see this factor, the product of 1 minus zn a n plus b n can be factor, factor out. And so I can remove it because it's an invertible element. And so I get that the, psi, the residue of psi times the product of this dt equals zero. So, so that's very, so it's a purely, uh, purely formal uh, statement. And the fact that conjecture two imply th this identity about the residue is uh, based on uh, how it is called Euler uh, characteristic formula principle means it is really totally elementary. So at least now we get something which contains some uh, more uh, some mathematical tools means uh, cohomology or homology. And I would like to explain some. Uh, supporting evidence for conjecture 2. And the first case is a case d equal 1 again. And in the case d equal 1, uh, What you have to compute is a com the homology of SL2 of T, C of T. And this is well known. This has been, compute this has been computed by Garland and Lepovsky and they prove that this is L2K. And this is the SL2 module of dimension 2K plus 1. And especially it follows that for K equal 2 or more, then you immediately see that the there is no component, no adjoint or trivial component in the homology. So the conjecture is correct in that case. And, and also maybe this theorem of Galan and Lepovsky show what's the idea of the of the conjecture. Because in some sense, Garland and Lepovsky theorem gives you a very difficult proof of the fact that the free Jordan algebra in one variable is this. And they expect that this very difficult proof, which is totally useless proof in some sense, uh, can be much more useful for higher degrees. For, or other uh, and what what else uh, and for other D what we get by your conjecture is also something about the dimension of these <laughs> and it turns out that we find way to compute this dimension for small dimension and it's always agree and it's so, dimension of B n of D equal B n 
whenever it is computable or or n less or equal than 15 is unequal to. Yeah, for d equal to, everything is computable, but we check it only up to n equal 15. For other cases, we check whenever it is computable that it is correct. And it's very, and it's, uh, and it's very amusing because even if you take the ca case d equal to, the dimension of this bn of 2 is given by a very complicated uh, formula which involve, for example, the number of non-oriented necklaces, something which is not totally obvious. It's a much, it's a not a smooth formula as for the dimension of Gn of 2. And still, it fits with the conjecture. Now, yes. So now I will... Uh, Keep the details about the verification we have done to, for this conjecture, and I would like to come to conjecture three. Because I first, I was expecting that conjecture two should be easy, because my, my way to think about this is simply, it's very easy to find an L infinity algebra, which has the right property, the right homology. And by Quillen theorem, we know that we can go from L infinity algebra to differential graded algebra. And if we have a differential graded algebra, then uh, there is no difficulty. But the problem is to keep everything in category T. And the problem is that in Quillen construction, I refer to this Quillen work on um, um, rational homotopy theory, he is using as all people in homological algebra, a lot of tensor construction. Means when you have something, you take the symmetric tensor, and then you take again the exterior tensor and thing. And of course, the category T is not stable by this construction. So that's, that's what. So, so I know that there is a L infinity algebra which satisfies the right property, but I don't know to prove that it is homotopic to something in the Lie theory. That's, that's a difficulty. And so it would it was and so also conjecture two when you make computation it turns out that conjecture two is only possible if there is it's almost force you to prove something about Jordan algebras and I will come to this. And so conjecture three is simply that the cohomology of SL2J, when you take the invariant part of it, this is zero for k greater or equal than two, say. or greater or equal than one. Okay. So conjecture three is only half of conjecture two. You only care about uh, trivial representation. And indeed, the uh, result is that conjecture 3 for SL2 of G, D plus 1, implies conjecture 1 for SL2, for GD. Okay, you have to add one variable, but this is enough. I will not explain the, the proof of that, but yes, now I will say a few words about the proof of that, but first I would like to, to say a few things about this. This is a, this is a lot better as a conjecture, because is it equivalent, obviously equivalent to the fact that the cohomology, or the homology, say, 
of SL2 of G D plus C is the same as the homology of SL2. So now, another way to express it, you take the free journal algebra with unit. So now the SL2 of this will contain SL2. And basically, the conjecture, this conjecture is equivalent to the fact that the cohomology of this is no, no more than the cohomology of SL2. So you have dimension one uh, in degree three, but that's all. So there's nothing more. Um, because this, if you look at uh, the old work of Kozul, this is the same as relative homology, homology theory, so it's, it's very easy. And so, because now we are in the, we, are, we have only a cohomology with a trivial coefficient, I think this conjecture is much more uh, tractable because you have much more structure on that than on the cohomology with uh, adjoint, uh, the adjoint part of the cohomology, which means something like the cohomology uh, with adjoint coefficient, which, you know, in cohomology theory, when you have non-trivial non module, it's much more difficult to, 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 to explain what it is. But I will now explain the proof of uh, why conjecture 3 implies conjecture, conjecture 1. So now I introduce GD how it is called, this is a script G, it's not capital G this is all multilinear multilinear part of G, D. Yes. yes. It means all polynom uh, journal polynomials which are linear in each variable. And of course, this is a representation of the symmetry group. Indeed, when you take the collection of G of D, this is what is called an operad, but we will not care about this here. And the main theorem is that G of D is uh, SN plus one, uh, SD plus one module, meaning the corresponding operad is cyclic. And it's Amusing because here, at the difference with the associative apparat, we don't have trace. So the proof is based on, on a dual argument. It's a relatively long proof, which is based on a dual argument. And it turns out that this is you have a map from J of D to T of D, of course. T of D are all monomials, uh, all free monomials, associative monomials. Or you can even take the uh, invariant. And uh, it turns out that the SD plus one structure are compatible. And as a consequence of that is the fact that the special identities in D variables is indeed, uh, SD plus one module. And 
But of course, it's extremely difficult to compute. And uh, only the first identity which are known and the Glenny identities, which are identities of degree 8. And so let me draw some pictures. Okay, the fact this uh, cyclicity is really important to prove that conjecture 3 implies conjecture 1. And, and basically, when you look at conjecture 2, you see that it's almost false that this is true. But this is a proof consequence. And if you take the Glenny identities, it is a S8 module which corresponds to the following Young diagram. Sorry. Okay. And of course, we try to compute the corresponding, what is the corresponding module for S9. And, but we cannot. There are two possibilities. First one, is that it extends as the S9 module Uh, like this, 3, 3, 3, 3. And you know, this S9 module is isomorphic to this one, or, or it is inside uh, what it is in, or it's inside uh, the following module, 3, Three, two, one. Yeah. And in that case, it, and this case is also interesting, it, it would mean that there is new identity of degree 8 with four variables. We can uh, tr we try to compute these identities and it's something which contains 100 terms. And it's really, to be honest, I didn't try to write it explicitly. But I believe it's impossible to determine if it's zero or not. So both cases could be interesting, but I don't know which, which is the right answer. This is only two possibilities. I can prove it. That's not. But uh, so this would mean new identities in degree 8 with four variables. And this would mean, uh, okay, that it's extend to S9 module, uh, but we cannot determine which is the correct answer. Uh, we try to make, if I can make some advertisements, if someone is interested in uh, formal computations, I look at the package of Sage, which is called Jordan, and clearly it has, it has to be redone. So this could be a good challenge. Because the Sage package can compute only uh, special journal algebras. And okay, so thank you very much for your passion.
the only change, the only real change to the program is uh, is the next door. Uh, 